is celebrating the 20th anniversary of Janet Jackson's phenomenal album, The Velvet Rope, by speaking to the people who were involved with the album and the world tour. And we are beyond thrilled to welcome back to the show Grammy Award-winning super producer Jimmy Jam, who's worked with the musical elite of the record industry, including Michael Jackson, Boyz II Men, Usher, Kanye West, Mary J. Blige, George Michael, Mariah Carey, the list goes on and on. And of course... Janet Jackson. Jimmy, thank you so much for spending time with us on the show. Well, thanks for having me. I wanted to start off, obviously this is really special for us celebrating the 20th anniversary of The Velvet Rope. I know that so many of us were were changed by the album. And so I wanted to ask you, how did things actually go down when it came time to start uh, The Velvet Rope? Did Janet sort of give you a call and say, hey Jimmy, time to go to work? Yeah, I mean, basically it was, um, you know, she had taken a, a little bit of a break after the the Janet album and the tour and, and all of that stuff. And so it was, um, you know, kind of cool to get back, you know, to know we were getting back into doing an, an actual album. We had done a couple of songs for the Design of a Decade album, you know, sort of in between. And um, probably the thing I remember the most about getting back together was that uh, most of the time when we had done Janet's records, we had always kind of come up with the tracks first, even if there were sort of ideas of, of what you know the songs would be about we would do the tracks first and this album she had basically written sort of the lyrics like she already knew what kind of you know what the lyrics were going to be so it was kind of a different way of of working where she it was almost like you know we we had to interpret the lyrics into music rather than the other way around her kind of interpreting lyrics with the music we made we had to interpret her lyrics that were already done. So it was interesting. Not all the songs were like that, but a lot of them were. And Mm -hmm. she is a very, she had a lot of really strong ideas about, about what it was. And um, so it was, um, it was exciting. It was challenging, but it was, um, you know, we, we couldn't wait to go because you know, it had been, you know, four years since, um, since doing the Janet album. So we we had felt like we had been (laughs) waiting to, actually get back together and do some stuff. Now, obviously, you and Janet are close friends, and I'm assuming that you knew at the time that she'd sort of been going through that that mental, emotional journey that she'd been on. Um, she talked about that quite a bit throughout the promotion of the album, um, what she had sort of gone through. And I wanted to ask you, did your role have to change a little bit with regards to the recording process of The Velvet Rope because Janet herself has said uh, that there was days where she was just too emotional to record? Well, yes. There were, yeah, there were a lot of days where she just wasn't up to it. Now, at the time, I don't necessarily remember thinking that there was anything so much wrong other than, you know, there's days that you just aren't feeling it. And that's the one thing about, you know, a human voice and a human being versus a piece of equipment. You know, if you turn a keyboard on, it's going to play. You want it to play a certain sound, it, it plays, you know. Um, humans are not like that, just overall. So we many times would have days where we didn't do a whole lot of work, but we may sit around and play video games or we may watch TV or we may just tell stories or, or whatever, or listen to other music, you know? So there were always a lot of days like that, just as we always recorded, but, um, days where she just flat out, just didn't want to come to the studio and that there were probably more on this album, I'd say. Um, Because the studio for her had always been sort of her safe place. I mean, even as recently as as uh, as unbreakable. I mean, she couldn't wait to get to the studio. So yeah, it did strike me a little bit that that you know maybe during during the Velvet Rope sessions, but I didn't really chalk it up so much to the emotion of it as much as you know people change and some days if you're just not feeling it. I mean, her her life was overall getting more complicated as life tends to be as you as you get older um there's just more things um that get thrown at you and that so i kind of felt that more so than any other thing and i've always as far as um you know we as producers just overall i think part of our role is is being uh, a psychiatrist a a psychologist um a coach uh, a mentor um really whatever it takes to get the best performance and that includes everything from kind of recognizing when some, you know, when, when an artist doesn't want to do it, when she's not feeling it, to the days to kind of push through, you know, where it's like, I'm not feeling it today, but you know that, you know, it's there. 
and you just have to somehow coach them through it and, and get it done. So all of those different scenarios just kind of always happen on all the records, but probably a little more so on, on this one. Although, um, you know, last thing I'd say about it is that she's such a professional that even though we were friends, she didn't, uh, I think a lot of times she held things back from time to time just because she didn't want her burden to become everybody else's burden. And she's kind of like that across. I mean, I think you'll hear that from everybody that works with her. Like she doesn't really put her problems on other people. And then later on, you know, two years down the line, she'll say, hey, remember that day that I didn't show up because whatever, whatever. And then she'll tell you what it was, and it'll be some devastating, crazy thing. And you'll go, man, <laughs> you know, why didn't you say something? And it's like, because I don't want to bother you with it. And that's that's kind of the way she's she's just built. Wow. Um, do you remember, Jimmy, what song you actually worked on first for the Velvet Rope? And, and where did most of the recording take place? Um, wow. What song came first? I think it was Tonight's the Night because one of the ideas that was one of the ideas she had talked about was that she always loved that song and wanted to do a remake of it. And so we thought it would be cool to do this kind of, you know, very kind of sexy remake but with kind of a hip hop beat and our blueprint or at least my blueprint in creating the track was the way um the fujis had done killing me softly um, with lauren hill was kind of they took a beautiful ballad and then you know made a kind of a hip hop record out of it so that was kind of what we were thinking um in, in the texture of the record and uh, and that one was easy to do because the lyrics were already written and everything was already done. And um, so that was the first one we did. I do I do remember that. And we were actually I remember we were so excited that how well we thought it came out, because you never know every time you go into a project, you just you just don't know. I mean, you, you feel like you know how to do your job, but it's all really about the inspiration and you know, always a whole lot of different elements go into it. But I do remember that one coming out really good. Like we really felt good about, um, you know, where it was. And um, it was it was pretty cool. For the concept of the album, the Velvet Rope part of things, I know you said that she already had some strong ideas um, before she even got into the studio. Did you know very early on that the Velvet Rope was going to be the theme or did that sort of transpire as you started putting songs together? Yeah, I, I think we kind of knew that the Velvet Rope was going to be the theme of the album and that the songs were going to kind of revolve around that. And that was different. I mean, Rhythm Nation, we didn't know Rhythm Nation was going to be Rhythm Nation until a little bit into the record. On the Jana record, I don't think we necessarily knew, you know, what that was going to be. Control, I don't think we knew either. I mean, we, we didn't start off and go, okay, this, is going to be, this album is going to be called Control, and this is what it's going to be, or this is going to be Rhythm Nation. Velvet Rope, we pretty much said the album's going to be called The Velvet Rope. And then we, while we didn't initially have a song, The Velvet Rope, she had the lyrical idea about, um, you know, we have a special need to, to feel like we belong and, and all of that. So it was just a matter of then us coming up with music to support that. Speaking of The Velvet Rope song itself, um, and then sort of picturing the tour, because obviously she sort of, she came out to that song and it was so epic and they looked amazing with their top hats and all that stuff. The song itself it's so grand. Like, it's, I don't even know another way to explain it. It's just, it's grand, it's regal, it's amazing, it's deep. Like, was that a, like a, a, a complex song for you guys to put together, knowing that the album's theme was sort of, you know, following underneath it? It was, um, I, I think once we figured out kind of what we wanted to do, it, it, but it took a lot of, it did take a lot of thought, I will say that. We knew that it, the elements that we wanted it to have, we knew that we wanted it to be based in hip-hop, as a lot of the album is. A lot of it is sample based. A lot of it is hip hop based. We just were really feeling that as as the sonic you know landscape of what the album should be. So we knew it should be that. So the idea of taking you know a classic um, you know sample from uh, what's it, not Buffalo Girls but whatever the Malcolm McLaren song, you know that was you know Trevor Horn Malcolm McLaren and that was such a popular song back in the day that we thought it'd be great to take it, loop it, but then create another song on top of it. And you hear a lot of different things. There's the, the theme from Tubular Bells, um, or the song called Tubular Bells, which was the theme from The Exorcist, is also in there. And sonically for us, 
that was sort of the unknown or the, I won't say the mnemonic state or, or whatever, but it was the sonic that it needed, that something was a little amiss and not quite rooted where it should be, if that makes any sense. So mm-hmm. there were all kinds of sprinkles of those kinds of sonics in the song, along with the break, you know, with the crazy violin and the, and the whole thing. But always at the end of the day, we still wanted to have something that you could dance to and that you could groove to. So saying all that, yes, it was very complex to do, but I loved the way it turned out. And I, and I think as producers, as we kind of hit our stride, um, particularly in working with Janet, but just kind of overall myself and Terry, it became easier for us to think very complex things in our head and then pull them off sonically. Whereas I think in the beginning, a lot of things were what I call happy accidents. It's kind of like, wow, that drum sound sounds really cool, but oh, that's because we plugged the drum machine in wrong. You know, it's like <laughs> those kinds of things used to happen. And But we got to a certain point where what we visualized in our head was kind of what it was. So when you call the Velvet Rope a grand song, mm-hmm. see, I, I love that because that is, it was a heavy topic that needed a weighty, soundtrack to go with it so that you knew when you heard it this is going to take you on a journey this is it's almost like a cinematic record in a way and and that's what it was and of course when you pair it as you said with janet's amazing choreography and staging and everything that happened when it became the life you know that was kind of the final you know the final exclamation point on it if you would but but sonically no we, we, we were going for something very diverse and very dark and very haunting as those feelings would be. You right. know, that's what we were trying to do. I have some more specific questions about certain songs, and I'm going to get to them in just a sec. But with the, the overall project, Jimmy, as you look back at, at the, the Velvet Rope, the album, do you like, because again, all of our albums are amazing. Like, they're just, that's what they are. But this one, uh, and maybe because it was the time of my life, I don't know, but it just seems to totally stand, stand out. To me, it almost seems like her opus, for back, for lack of a better word. And like, I'm just wondering how you feel when you look back on it. Like, like as the overall album, like, where does it stand in, in your thought process of her overall catalog? I think, you know, I think it's a really special album. I think it's the most unique of the albums. And I think... You know, each album is, you know, it's kind of like your kids. It's like each album is, is my favorite for different reasons, and having to pick a favorite is really tough. So I won't. I won't pick a favorite. But I will say that Velvet Rope was definitely the most complex record, which it needed to be. I love, as I said earlier, the sonic use of uh, the amount of sampling we did, um, the hip-hop influence it's all over the record from, you know, using um, Cisco Kid in You to, um, you know, Joni Mitchell, Big Yellow Taxi to, um, you know, Go Deep, which had, you know, was kind of our DJ Quick West Coast influenced uh, hip hop uh, sound. Like all of those things to me on the record made it really a, a special record. And, uh, but 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 very but you know but it was varied. I mean, there was a whole lot of different things that happened on there, um, and I, I, I so I I love it. I mean, I, I just think it's um it's probably if if I was going to play one Janet album to someone that she wanted to show the kind of depth of her and her ability to really combine different genres of music like nobody else that's probably the album i mean that album is like a tour de force to me um sonically mm-hmm. and um lyrically and um so i mean yeah i would and, and and obviously you know the other piece of it too is obviously in hindsight you you get to see the uh influence that it had on people and um i, I will say it was a very influential album um, because it spoke to the insecurities that many people had, whether male, female, young, old, gay, straight, it didn't matter. It, it spoke to those insecurities, and once again, it did the thing that Janet um, is known for to me, which is just being a human, 
she is a human being and so accessible and any thoughts and any you know things that you want to know about her if you just listen to her lyrics and listen to her her music you they will tell you everything that that you need to know and so i think this album does absolutely wonderful job in doing it and and as i watch the debates on social media about you know the greatest records um there seems to be with the fans um certainly that grew up with her uh, a really special place in their heart for this record and it was a challenging record in many ways but ultimately very very satisfying joining us on the kelly alexander show grammy award-winning producer jimmy jam make sure to follow him on instagram and twitter at flight time jam got till it's gone so first of all the song is just amazing like i just i get shivers every time i think about it was it an easy decision to make that the first single and how did the song come about yeah well first yeah first question yes it was very easy to make it the first single it was for us it was just um you know we always think of the first singles as sort of the introduction to kind of to for what's to come and it's kind of like the i haven't seen you for a while but i'm i'm back you know here i am um, and I thought that single, because it was a dance record, the tempo of the record, the uh, Joni, having Joni Mitchell as a, as a part of it, you know, even as a sample was, was amazing. So, I mean, I think for all of those reasons, it was, for us, it was a pretty easy choice. The record was really stemmed from kind of one of the things we would always do. And I've said this before, like before we would start a record, uh, a Janet record, we would always go and listen to songs of old songs that we liked, that either songs she grew up with or songs we grew up with, or, you know, we would play things back and forth and say, hey, have you heard this? Have you heard this? Have you heard this? And then we would land on different things that we thought were kind of cool. And one of the things we landed on was our mutual love of Joni Mitchell. And in my mind, I always thought, because as I said, I was in a very, uh, you know, hip hop state of mind for whatever reason at that point in time, I just thought it would be great to do some sort of treatment to Big Yellow Taxi because I always loved um, the don't I always see in the go that you don't know what you got to it's gone. I thought it was so relevant, not only to the album we were making, but just in, in general. So the first thing we did was I just, the beat was really kind of interesting. There was a, a drum programmer named Alex Richburg who had um, programmed for us for, for quite a while. And he made a setup in my studio where it was set up. I always used to just play everything just live. Like I would set, the, I would press play and record, and then I would just kind of play everything. He's made this whole MIDI setup for me and said, make a record over the weekend just using this setup. Don't use your other stuff. Just use this. And I'm just like, okay. So it was basically an MPC drum machine. I think I was I was an insonic uh, keyboard of some sort and, and something else. It was like three keyboards. That's all I or two keyboards and a drum machine. That's all I had, and I had to do it in that format. So that was the reason that the song was so simple. It was just the boom, 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 boom for the chords because I was like I can't do anything more complicated than that because I don't really know what I'm doing. So I did that. The inspiration for the song came from um, Brand New Heavies had a, a song called Sometimes. I think it was called Sometimes. And Jay Dilla, who is one of my favorite all-time producers, rest in peace, Dilla, had done a remix for the song. And, and it had this kind of jumpy, stop-and-start feel that, that was kind of imprecise. Like, at that point, you know, a lot of records were very kind of perfect-sounding, but the way he did his beats, everything sounded very kind of imperfect. And I wanted to duplicate, uh, duplicate that feel. So... When I did the bass line, for instance, I call it the drunk bass line. So rather than play it correctly, I almost played it incorrectly, kind of behind the beat a little bit and that. And then instead of correcting it through computers or whatever, I just left it like that. And then the sample, which is, you know, just went into a little, uh, a little sampler called an AMS. I put that in there. And then to make it sound more authentic, I put like scratching sounds in there. So to make it sound like I was scratching a record, but I really wasn't, but that was the idea. I will say the other, the other thing that led us in that direction was that we knew that Q-tip was going to be a part of the record. And it was important for us. It was kind of like when we did new agenda, we tried to make a track that kind of had the elements of public enemy because we knew Chuck D was going to be on it. So this, I tried to get the elements of, tribe called quest and and kind of make something that sort of like what they would do so that q 
Q-tip would feel comfortable on it. So that was sort of the combination that happened. I remember we got the track done. I played it for Janet. She loved it. And then we both kind of looked at each other and said, mm, we should call Joni Mitchell. Yeah, <laughs> make sure she's okay with us doing it. And um, we got her number. Janet talked to her. She couldn't have been nicer. She just said, I can't wait to hear what you guys come up with. She was so sweet. And so we knew once we had that go-ahead, we were good. Lyrically, uh, well, melodically, actually, the song changed a couple of times. We actually did a whole different lyric and a whole different song that was about, I just remember it was about a girl losing her doll or something like that. And I remember we were listening to it, and it somehow just wasn't working. And then Janet later on said, I got a different melody. Let's try this melody. And then that's how the melody that ended up, and then that led to a whole different set of lyrics. But I... I have the old lyrics. I think I posted them on my Twitter probably about a year ago, and maybe I'll maybe I'll post uh, I'll post them again, um, you know, in honor of, of this. But it was a whole different thing. It worked with "Got Till It's Gone," but it just was a different, you know, sentiment. So, um, but that's the story of the song, and we were really happy with the way it came out. And Q-Tip, of course, did a, a ridiculous job. We actually went to New York to Hit Factory to to catch his part of it. So being in New York. And having that feel was a, a, a very important part of this record. And overall, I'll say that that was another thing about this record, whereas most of the other Janet albums we had worked on were pretty much in Minneapolis, a lot of Velvet Rope stemmed from working in New York and Los Angeles. So just being in a different environment gives you a different creativity. We did still did the bulk of it in Minneapolis, but we did a lot more of it in other studios, um, which you know turned out, I think, um, uh, really well. And when did you guys move, Jimmy? It wasn't long after that, right? Like a couple years after you moved to L.A., like full-time? We moved. So Velvet Rope was like 97, right? Yeah. And then I think we moved about 2002. Oh, okay. We, we moved. Because we, we, we still, All For You, we were still in Minneapolis. So we recorded some of All For You in Minneapolis. But once again, we, st- we did do a lot of recording on the West Coast on, on that album. So... We were kind of in the transition stage and then moved to L.A. right after that. So kind of 2002, I think, officially uh, moved to L.A. Okay. Now, Together Again, an anthem for so many people and for so many different reasons. How did that song actually come together? And lyrically, when you listen to the song, it's it's I I always wondered if the lyrics kind of just poured out of you guys because it's so catchy. It's so easy to sing along to. The lyrics are actually in a way simple, but very smart the way you did it. So did you know, like, again, right off the top that you had something special with that song? Yeah, Together Again was always, always felt very, very special. Now, so, um, the kind of the, the, the melodicness of it, I always, in thinking about Janet's voice, I always thought there were two kinds of voices. There's the kind of voice that you listen to. And then there's the kind of voice you sing along with. And Janet, to me, was always the kind of voice you sang along with. So in creating the melodies and, and really the structure of the song and the chords and everything, I thought about two, the kind of the two most melodic things that in, in my life growing up, in my love of music, one was Motown and the other was Philadelphia International. So for me, that track is sort of the best of what Motown would do with the kind of vibes and the kind of, you know, feel of the, uh, uh, almost like something Diana Ross would sing, mm-hmm. would be a, my comparison, if you think about the melody of, of the verse. And uh, there's even a little background uh, thing on the second verse that goes, uh, which is basically a, a lick from... Uh, I Need Your Lovin', which was a Four Tops record. So there's all kinds of little sonic cues if you listen to Motown. But then the feel of it, um, which is kind of a, more of a house feel, but with a little bit of a shuffle on the drums, that's an ode really to Philadelphia International and the Gamble and Huff records uh, from back in that day, the Sal Soul Orchestra and those records. So it was for me, sonically, that was kind of what I was going for. And the lyrics just were, once again, perfect and poured out of her because, you know, it was a true story about a friend of her. So it was, you know, it just kind of came together. That one came together really quick. And the only thing we went back and forth about on that song was whether to start it slow. I, I, I had it in my mind kind of like a Donna Summer, Let's Dance. Yep. Like how cool would it be to start it really slow 
And Janet was like, I don't know. I don't know. I want to sing it slow and, you know, whatever. And it ended up being one of the signatures of the song. And and so it worked out really well. And then even the way that it ends with just kind of a, a, a vibraphone solo, which is very, you know, 70s, uh, you know, Motown or, or Philadelphia International, if you, if you think about those records. So, but obviously a great message and one that connected everybody. And it was a matter of, of celebrating life rather than mourning death. And I think she's had that in other records, but that's the record that came together. And I just saw her in Anaheim the other night. And Together Again is just so special in concert. I remember there was a gentleman that did a review of the concert, and I put that on my, I put, I put the review or the blurb from on, on my Instagram, and he said that when everybody started jumping up and down on the course of the song, like the building shook, like he had never experienced before. And uh, it was almost like an earthquake happening. And so to be able to affect people like that and have everybody really moving together as one um, with a song, it's, that's so powerful and, and such a blessing to have been a part of, of making that happen. But once again, at the end of the day, Janet's the one that brings that whole thing to life. And you know, about Together Again, it's just such a great pop song. And, and for me as a radio announcer, it's a great barometer to see, like, like you guys, Jimmy, like you were able to get the white people up dancing with that. You know what I mean? Like, like when you get the, <laughs> yeah. when you get the white people that are from, like, middle America. No, it, kind of, it, w- it was interesting because um, when the record came out, well, when, when Got Till It's Gone came out, it was very interesting because Janet had always had, a, you know, a huge R&B following and black following from the beginning. But obviously, with the control record crossed over, and basically ended up with a worldwide following uh, from from everybody, right? And so she had always had that. And it was interesting when we released "Got to Let's Go On." Pop radio pretty much ignored that record, at least here in the states. Uh, they did. They pretty much ignored that record. Whereas uh, black radio, it went straight to number one. When we came out with "Together Again," all of a sudden, all of pop radio took it to number one. Black radio was kind of uh, a little indifferent to it. They played it, but not to a level of, of, you know, that you'd expect. When we got to the third single, I Get Lonely, that was the one that everybody connected, right? Yep. It was, mm-hmm. You know, uh, I think number one uh, R&B and, and top five, I think, on the pop chart. So it was interesting watching that happen because that really hadn't happened for a while with the Janet records. It was kind of like everybody loved the records. But uh, but it was interesting. But no, we, we loved it. I mean, Together Again was a huge record across the board. And, you know, we did a remix. There was a couple oh, of really yeah. great remixes. A DJ Premier did a great remix that she, um, in the Unbreakable show, she actually did a piece of it, which was kind of cool. And then uh, we did a, a very down-tempo, uh, made a ballad out of it, basically, and, and changed the melody and, and everything. And she did a video for that, which is pretty incredible, too. So the song just lent itself to a whole lot of different treatments and it was it was a lot of uh, fun to work on speaking of i get lonely i have to ask you about that because that song again like sh- i love that song and i think i've told you that before and i know everybody feels the same way you know the chord progression the overall vibe of it how did that one come to you guys because i even remember when she went on rosie o'donnell and performed it you know just with the backup vocalist and and the keyboard i think it was J- jimmy Wright. i think right was playing there but like it was yeah, just it was, it was amazing yeah. and and she just you know it was such a, a stripped down version and it still sounded amazing. So can you tell us about that song? So, yeah. So I Get Lonely was really a lot of that, the iteration for that song. And, and the playing on that song is Jim Wright. So if you watch the, uh, the Rosie episode, that's Big Jim Wright that's singing along with her. And he's the one that's playing on the record. The idea with that was I knew what the chord should be. <laughs> I just couldn't play them because I, you know, um, I don't really come from a gospel background um, in my playing style. So I know what those chords are supposed to be, but when I play them, it doesn't sound authentic. So Big Jim, I remember, came to the studio and we were sitting there and I said, okay, I said, okay, now you know them chords, those church chords, those that kind of bluesy whatever. And he just started playing and I said, yeah, that's it. Okay, then it goes here and it goes to here and it goes to here. And the next thing you know, we had it. And it was like so simple, but for him to do. <laughs> but not for me to do. So I give Big Jim a lot of credit for the arrangement and for the playing on that record, which was absolutely pivotal to making work. The other thing, just for me, 
for the small amount of your audience that actually listens to bass lines on records and cares about them. Um, that song for me, because I did the, the keyboard bass on that song, is probably in my top five of all the keyboard basses on songs I've ever done in my life. I mean, one time, uh, if you're any your listeners are interested and you're, you're, you happen to be a keyboard player or, or, or interested in that kind of stuff, just listen to the way the bass moves on that song. And the cool thing about it was it was just played live. It wasn't this nothing sequence. There's nothing corrected. But the song, but what happens is through the bass line of the song, the song actually builds and, and kind of moves. And um, it's interesting. And so even when she was singing and doing ad libs and, you know, doing the things on, uh, you know, her vocals on the record, it was cool because the bass kind of led her to where she needed to go. Like if it needed to be a soulful ad lib or a real up tempo type ad lib or, or whatever, the bass actually was the thing that really drove that song along with obviously Big Jim's piano. Uh, he played piano on that, and then he played, I think, two different electric pianos on there a Wurlitzer and a Rhodes, which are both kind of standard, uh, you know, R&B keyboards. And then we added the, the horns and the other elements to it. So. It was cool. And then the drum beat on the song, too, um, Alex Richburg, who was one of our, as I've mentioned, to help me with God Till It's actually helped program the drums on that. So um, he was able to give it, once again, a, a, take the R&B of it, but also give it a very much a hip-hop feel and kind of a, as we called it at the time, like a double-time feel, where it almost sounded like a fast song, but it was actually a slow song. And I remember that happening a lot on, on a lot of Timbaland records. I mean, that was, that was a style that Timbaland really um, helped innovate. So, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's so many influences and inspirations that happen on that record that, that you hear that when I think of it, I kind of think about all those different inspirations and it had to happen in order for the record to be made. So I Get Lonely was definitely one that uh, a lot of different elements came together. And, and obviously the, the, the one the one element in, every, in all of this is Janet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she, she kills it, you know. Uh, when we speak about the, because um, obviously there's a lot of like really deep songs, if I can call them that, and with lots of depths and, and, and lots of meanings behind them. When we speak about the song You and What About, were those actually the most challenging songs for Janet to record, to maybe write and record? You was tough to sing because she wanted to sing it in her natural and she wanted to sing it real. You know, we can add distortion to her voice to kind of make things sound angry, but she wanted to do it herself. She wanted the song to have that you know that energy to it like that and she had to sing it really really low think about the you know it's funny the people talk about when they talk about singers a lot of times they talk about their vocal range like how low can they sing and how high they can sing and i think that's something i'm going to mention it here i sorely overlooked with janet think about the low vocal in that song we that's not electronically altered that's her actually singing low on you just like she did on If, the low parts on If. I mean, she actually has that range down to there, but then, of course, can go super high, like on Pleasure Principle or on Rhythm Nation or whatever. So I think that's an important part of it. But but you was, um, other than her singing in the low voice, but trying to be keep that edge of anger or, uh, you know, passion, it was a very draining song. It takes a lot of physical energy to sing like that. So that's like, I remember putting that together and that was, that was the main thing with that. What was the other one you what asked a, about? What about? Oh, uh, what, well, what about was, um, whew. what about once again, I mean, just because of the contrast of what the, what the vocal needed to be, because it had to contrast as the track did sort of the abusive nature of, of relationships um, because it's always, you know, you break up and you make up and you break up and you make up. So it was really like two songs in one. It was, it was kind of like, you know, this kind of idyllic, beautiful relationship until it wasn't. And then it was horrible. It was the worst of the worst. But then at the end of it, you then make up or, or whatever. And now you're back to this. And it, and it, it turns into this pattern. And that's kind of what that's kind of sonically what what the song was, you know. I don't know. I mean, I, I I think just the energy that went into the vocal performances of that was probably, you know, as you as you, as you go back and revisit it and listen to it again, just think about all the energy that had to go into that, and also think about 
that Janet's singing every vocal on there. It's not like it's Janet sings the vocal and then we bring in background vocalists. She's doing every vocal on those songs. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of work and a lot of concentration. So I think the, I think both songs are physically draining, but I also think that when you're talking about subjects that are near and dear, or I shouldn't say near and dear, but very relevant to you, I think would probably be the better word. It's good to put, it almost is a, a catharsis, I guess is the word. It it's, it's, feels good to get it out. And I think you hear that on the frustration, you hear the pain, and you hear that on the recording. And our, our job is just to capture that. But she, she brings it. She brings it on both those songs. I wanted to ask you specifically about one of the interludes, because I remember at the time when I heard the album and, and heard this interlude, because like, you know, when you're a kid and you're um, you know a fan of any celebrity or whatever, like you always kind of see what you see on television, which is, you know, they get driven around in limos and their life is so great and they have a beach house and like whatever. And then right. I remember um, the interludes sad, the one where she says, you know, um, you know, it doesn't matter. You, you can still have everything and still feel sad. Um, I remember hearing that. It was like somebody punched me in the face. I was like, it's true. Like, you know, Janet, in a way, if you think about it, is a Jackson. She has everything she could possibly want. But, you know, you, you can have all the money in the world and it doesn't mean that you're in a good place mentally or emotionally. When she did that, did you know that it was going to be such a poignant interlude? Because, like I said, I'm this, like, you know, kid from the farm and, and, you know, way away from California. But just hearing that, like, I was sad and compassionate for her. Well, yeah, and I think it, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier is that, you know, there's a humanness about Janet that she... She, in a way, is all is all of us, you know. She has the good, she has the bad, she has ups and downs, family drama, family love. I think we all, whether we're in the Midwest, whether we're in Canada, um, L.A., it doesn't matter. At the, at the end of the day, we're, if we're human, we've experienced all of those emotions. And I think she's able to bottle those and creatively put them out there where, as you said, You'd never thought of that, really, because you think of Janet in limos and you think of that. But people at the end of the day still have the same insecurities and all of that. And I, I thought at the time when she was doing it, I mean, when you're in the moment of creating, it, it's just kind of you're just kind of creating. You're just kind of doing what you're what you're doing. But afterwards, yeah, I really it really made me think about how I don't know whether I want to say risky, but I, I think it was risk. I think it was a very risky album for her to do, actually with the themes involved, with the fact that some of the songs were very sonically challenging. I mean, we obviously had songs that, that resonated uh, with people um, as far as, you know, being hit records. But it was definitely a departure from, from the Janet album and certainly a departure from Runaway, which was, you know, from the, the design of a decade. So, yeah, um, it was definitely a different way to go. But I thought, yeah, I, the sad interlude is definitely kind of sums everything up because mm -hmm. it's kind of at the at the end of the day it doesn't really matter who you are or what walk of life or or, or race or religion or, or whatever you are if you're human at some point in your life you felt that way that you feel like you have everything you should have everything or ever you should be happy about everything and you're and you're just not so yeah i mean it's I mean, there's a lot of elements on the album like like that, but I think that one is is very poignant and also becoming before um, special. Yes, mm -hmm. which is you know, kind of the I don't know. It, it kind of is the it's the kind of the closer in the way that you know once again brings us together in the commonality of we all want to feel special in our own way, whether it's with our um, with our families, with our loved ones. Um, you know, whether we want to be famous in some way or whatever, we want to be special. At the end of the day, we, we want someone to recognize us as being individual and being special. And, and I think that was a great, um, you know, message to bring home. So the fact that the sad interlude came before that, and, and overall, just the sequencing of the album was so important to me to kind of tell the story and kind of weave you on a journey. And I think a lot of that's missing in albums these days, but it's something that Janet has always thought was very important and really charged us with as we're putting the songs together. Think about what works with another song and how we how we weave the story together, so to speak. Did and, you um, did you labor over you know, that? Jimmy? Velvet Rope was no exception, and, and probably 
you know, probably the best example of that. Did you labor over the sequencing? Because I'm actually looking at a track listing right now because I wanted to make sure I was on point when I was speaking to you about all of this. And and yeah, like uh-huh. for sure, it is definitely a story. And, and yeah, it's like you couldn't pick. I, like looking at the track listing right now, I can't imagine it being in any other order. So did it take right. forever to figure this? I know you guys are obviously super smart and, and, and you're, this is not your first kick at the rodeo, but knowing that this was such an important album for her, did you labor over it? Yes, we did. Although, you know, as we were doing it, we were thinking about it. It wasn't like we were done with the record and then we had no clue. So we were starting from a place of we have no clue which order these songs should be in. We knew Velvet Rope was going to start the album. We knew that there was going to be, um, I think we did Twisted Elegance is what we, we called it. But we wanted something to kind of let people know before they heard a single note that this is going to be this is not the last Janet album. We're, we're, cha- we're, you know, we're changing the channel. We're turning to a, well, we're not even turning to a different chapter in the book, really. We got a whole new book. And, th- and that was sonically what we wanted to hear. And, and you kind of, you kind of hear that on, on the record like that. So, and then, you know, fasten your seatbelts is kind of like, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny, like, because after we're, we're, we're done with, uh, you know, my need and we're going into go deep, which is more of a fun song, right? Cause that's kind of the record where she's with her friends and going out on a night on, on the town. So it's almost the equivalent, I guess a sonic equivalent of get the point. Good. Let's dance mm-hmm. on, on rhythm nation. You know, it's, it's kind of that point where it's like, okay, now we're going to go out, we're going to have some fun, you know? Um, so to me, it just kind of, yeah, it, it, it's supposed to just kind of weave, you to what what you're doing the funniest one to me to listen to now um because it takes me back to a different place and a lot of your younger listeners will have no idea what these sounds even are but the uh, interlude called online Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is comes before empty and it's basically the sound of a modem like in the old days where you used to have to dial to a place in order to get your internet connection it wasn't like there's no wi-fi nothing like that you literally had to, uh, it was called dial-up, and you had to call it on your phone in order to get your computer to work. And that sound in there is the sound of the dial-up. And at the time, that was such a common sound. Um, but it's a sound that I don't think anybody nowadays could identify it because you don't hear it, because there's no such thing as call-up, you know, or dial-in, or dial-up internet anymore. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. But... Um, but anyway, yeah, no, the interludes were important. The sequencing was really important. And, uh, you know, we, we took our time with it, and I think we got it right. And I agree with you. Things come in the order that they're, that they're supposed to. And um, somebody, last thing on that, I think somebody told me the other day that um, they hate that uh, they hate listening to the Janet albums on shuffle because, it, you know, the songs are still there, but there's something about hearing them in the order in which they were intended that makes it a much uh, a deeper listening experience as an album. And I, you know, I said, well, yeah, but it's good to have the, the variety, I mean, or the opportunity to do some, maybe people just want to pick out certain songs. And uh, they said, no, this, these albums are not cherry pick a song. <laughs> these albums are sit down for, you know, 50 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever, that long driving car and in, in traffic or whatever that is for you. And that's, what you put on and it's a journey from beginning to the end so that actually makes me feel good to to hear that that people feel that way about the record with regards to the tour itself um i was fortunate i got to go see that particular tour four times and i would have gone like a hundred times had i had the budget for it but like it was just it was such and i think i i share this with a lot of the fans where it just it was so amazing because like the music was amazing and then tina landon did such an amazing job with her you know assistants and herself and yes. and janet and yes. and making that stage show just what it was it was just incredible and i wanted to ask you if you knowing that you're a performer yourself looking over the velvet rope tour um and, and concert experience where does that rank for you jimmy well i think the velvet rope tour as far as her tours it probably ranks well it's tough to say but I, I guess I'll put it like this, and I, I don't mean to dodge the question, but I think that the, I think it was, it was just as the album was, I think the tour was really that moment of, I guess I'll use the word solidification, if that's a word. And what I mean by that is, 
the Ribbon Nation tour was incredibly successful. Uh, well, you know, really well done, well staged, and Janet was incredible in it. But she still was; it was still her first tour, and so you look at it like, uh, or at least I do, like, what an incredible debut tour! Never been one like it. No, no performer has come out to me. She was smart enough to knock the tour on control because she said, "I don't have enough hits," and so. By the time she toured on Rhythm Nation, she had taken care of that problem already. Like, she already had, at that point, I think, 15, top 10 or 16, just from the two albums. So she had enough to really put a great show together. So kudos to her, first of all, on the foresight to do that and really do it in a, in a great way. The Janet tour was wonderful because it was a whole different, you know, as Rhythm Nation was very metal and very black and white, um, the, the Janet tour was very romantic and I remember they had the big screens that had like big clouds around them and it was very romantic and, and that. Okay, so that was great for what it was. And she was great. But Velvet Rope was to me, it was her at her full strength. Mm -hmm. It was an emotional show. It was super theatrical. Great lighting, great choreography. I'm going to mention Tina Landon's name again because how incredible is she? And how integral when I talk about the team of people that put it together. At the end of the day, it's always Janet. But there's a great team of people behind her. And Tina absolutely just rocked this tour. I mean, it was just so amazing from the costume design to just just everything. I, I think it was just a, it was a comp, an accomplishment. It was just another level up. It was it was the if you had any doubts. And by that point, I don't know who would, but people always have doubts and people always hate and whatever that is. That tour to me was the tour that it was just like, okay, I give in. I wasn't a fan, but okay, I get it. You know, or, or I am a fan, but now I'm even a bigger fan or, or whatever that was. Uh, it was just, a, a, you know, the word I use was solidification. I hope that's a word. Um, I have to look it up. But it was that was the tour that to me really defined everything. It was just at that point. And... It was it was amazing, and the fact that it was on, you know, HBO did it. A lot of people that didn't get a chance to see it live got to see it. The HBO broadcast of it, which I thought they did a great job with. It was just all the right things, you know, at the right time. And she was in a great place as a performer, confident, passionate, um, all of those things. So yeah, I mean, it's it's it was definitely a defining moment. Uh, I guess I would say. I wanted to ask you this because I'm not sure if you've ever had this conversation with her about it, but and I know she does it on, on different tours as well, but for that tour specifically, when she came out, did like one or two numbers, and then stood there, right, for like two, three minutes, whatever it was, while the crazy applause went nuts. I remember being in the front right. row. I was fortunate to get a front row tickets uh, to the Det Detroit show, which was in July of 98. And I remember during that moment where she, you know, took the, those couple of moments to just sort of stand there and let the, the, the applause wash over her. I turned around just to kind of see what she, it felt like in a way to see what she was feeling. And like for me, it was overwhelming and people were not obviously clapping for me. Have you ever had that discussion with her? Like what it's like when she stands there and has 14,000 or 15,000 people just washing their love over her. Cause like we all saw the tear that went down, especially if you watch the HBO special, but like, do you, have you ever had that conversation with her? Like, I can't imagine what that feels like for her. We have not had that discussion. As a matter of fact, um, we've, we've had the discussion just in the sense that I told her, I love when she does that. <laughs> okay, I good. love how, um, you know, once again, it's, it's very daring to do that because, you know, <laughs> I, I think we did, I think we did have a conversation one time about like, what if I stand there and like everybody's just like, get to the next song. What you doing, girl? I think, I think we had a, a conversation like that one time. But I don't know. I don't think we've had an, ever had like a serious conversation where she's expressed how, how that feels. But I think you can see by the look on her face how she feels. And, and I think every time she comes back around with a tour, I mean, there is a moment, well, there's a couple of moments in, in, in the new tour, the State of the World tour, where that happens. Uh, it's very kind of spontaneous. And I just think that she's taking it all in, the fact that all of these people have come to actually see her. Um, I, I think there's a bit of disbelief that has to go into it because she's not a cocky person. She's not a, um, you know, ego thing. She, I mean, her, 
some people would do that and it would feel like, yeah, that's right. I know you like me, that kind of thing. That's not really her. She's, I think, more amazed uh, that people feel that way. But she returns that love. Um, and that's the way she feels about all the people that, that have come out, all the fans that come out to watch her. So it's, it's a great moment. It's a moment that I don't think a lot of people can do or would even be wise to do it. But for some reason for her, once again, just that humanity connection that she has, people want to show their love. They just want to show their love. Not, not applauding a song or a set change or a costume change or, or a choreographed moment. But no, just you, Janet, the person, we love you. And this is our opportunity to show that. I wanted to ask you, um, with regards to the fans, what you would like to say to them on this 20th anniversary of the Velvet Rope, because I, I know you know this already, but obviously the Velvet Rope changed uh, so many people's lives for so many reasons, whether it was the ability for someone to um, you know, mourn the loss of a loved one or to uh, you know, come out to their parents or family and friends. Like, there were just so many different reasons why that album is what it is. And obviously so many of us are just adore you and, and Terry and, and Janet, obviously, for creating this album together. What do you want to say to the fans on this 20th anniversary? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, could, I couldn't even put into words what I, what I would want to say and, and, and what my heart feels about it, but, um, you know, one of my favorite things is getting a chance to actually go see the shows. And then I feel, I get to feel a little bit of, about, you know, how, uh, you know, people feel about her. I mean, my job, I always looked at it like is as a producer, it's real simple, make her look the best that she possibly can. And the fact that people have embraced this record and bought this record. And as you said, changed their lives because of this record, uh, in a positive way, whether it's given them courage or, or hope, or um, you know, just uh, you know, understanding of, of, of that they're not alone. Uh, for all of those reasons, I mean, that's the beautiful thing that music does, and, and why it's such a blessing and such a privilege to be able to do it, and certainly to do it with someone like Janet, who is, um, you know, the ultimate of the ultimate. So, I don't know to the fans. I mean, I guess thank you is is about <laughs> as good as, as I can say it. But it's just thank you for all the love and the continued support. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, the, just the love and support over the years. And, and trust me, for me, it's not even whether people, because I, I hope people love the records. It doesn't matter who produced them or, or you know, who wrote them or, or the tech, technology or behind it or whatever. I, you know, for people that are into that, that's wonderful. But for people who aren't, who just, want an experience and, and something to, to change their lives and something to do that. That to me is the ultimate thank you, you know, to, to, from the fans to, to me and to Terry and to really all the team that, that, that helps uh, Janet put her thing together. That's what it's about. It's really at the end of the day, it's, it's allowing us to do what we do love to do, which is create songs and, and then receiving those songs. Um, so I just think thank you. That's about all I can all I can say. And you know, I, I just uh, I so appreciate it. And Kelly, I appreciate you and all the support you've given over the years. And um, you know, it's it's wonderful to speak to you. And uh, and because I, I know when I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to all the best uh, uh, all the best Janet fans there are, there are. You know, so uh, so it's wonderful. So I, I just uh, appreciate the opportunity. It's a privilege, and it's one we. We don't take lightly, and we're going to continue, um, you know, God willing to uh, hopefully continue to make great music uh, going forward. And before I let you go, I just wanted to um, ask one more thing with regards to the 20th anniversary and with Janet. Obviously, she's on tour right now, and I know she's got a lot going on. I know you saw her just a few days ago. Do you think, though, on October 7th that maybe she'll even have a moment to sort of be like, wow, like this is 20 years? Like, and, and, and how do you think she feels about uh, the Velvet Rope? I think the only way she has a moment about it is if somebody reminds her because she doesn't, I, I can't tell you all the times I've texted her or whatever, just at a, on a random day and said, Hey, you know, it's 30 years since control was released. And she just kind of goes, really? Wow. Like she's, <laughs> she's so forward thinking that she's not really, she doesn't really think about the milestones, but everybody else does. And I, and when they, a lot of times they alert me to, them. you know, I see all the time, there's, you know, a record. I mean, it seems like literally every day there's, a, there's something Janet 
of some sort of milestone, whether it's a concert she sold out, a, a record going number one, or a, you know, record being released, or there's some sort of something. There's almost like a daily. There should be should just do a Janet calendar, right? <laughs> it's just true. Janet stuff every day, <laughs> yeah. but she doesn't really keep up with that. So the way she finds out is is from the fans. If she reads the Twitter or she looks at the Instagram or whatever, or somebody tells her, somebody alerts her. I know Gil is on social media a lot, and sometimes Gil, I'll tell Gil, hey, Gil, did you see this? And he'll go, yeah, yeah, I'm going to forward this to her or, or whatever. But that's how she kind of keeps up. So I don't think she'll think about it unless somebody prompts her and reminds her maybe on the encore or something like that. Like, hey, by the way, you should mention, you know, and she'll go, oh, okay, I will, I will, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that that'll be the thing. Well, maybe, you know, I don't even know where she's at the 7th. I should, I, should, uh, I should find out. Yeah, you need to send her but a I'll message. But I'll make sure I remind her. <laughs> okay. And uh, on behalf of the fans, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to try not to get emotional, but thank you so much because, like I said, this album changed lives for so many people, and uh, it's just a complete honor to have you on the show. And thank you, and Terry and Janet, for this. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for, like I say, for all your love and support, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. That is uh, Grammy Award-winning producer Jimmy Jam. Make sure you follow him on Instagram and Twitter, at Flight Time Jam. Hey, it's Kelly. Thank you so much for hanging out and watching and listening to our interviews. We always appreciate your time. Please make sure to follow us on our YouTube channel and also hit up our website so that you can subscribe to our newsletter so you are always up to date with everything that we have got going on with the show. KellyAlexanderShow.com slash subscribe.